Hello, welcome uh, back to the second uh, of these streams that I've been experimenting with over the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, particularly welcome back to those of you that were here last time. Uh, it is very much down to you that have I uh, decided to give it another shot this week. It was by far a certainty that doing a live stream was something I was ever going to do again. And just uh, the amazing conversations that we had last time, the amazing input from you guys, the way that everyone just really got stuck in on the chat uh, just really made me want to try it again. So it won't always necessarily be every week, but uh, it is something that I'm hoping to sort of make a part of uh, what I do. Uh, do let me know uh, just that you can hear me and see me in the chat. In fact, you'll already have noticed a couple of extra bells and whistles on the screen of stuff that I have been uh, working on as uh, particularly today, but over the past week just to, I don't always get things perfect on this channel, but I do like to uh, put in the effort to try and make things look good uh, or vaguely good where I can. Uh, and uh, one extra uh, bell and whistle singular possibly yeah uh that i've got this week is that we can go over to the chat and we should be able to see brilliant uh so we appear to have some people uh around which is excellent uh hello mr fish says hello camille says hello uh quinta uh, says critical theory special please uh yes that is actually something that is forthcoming uh i know i did my episode of what the theory on the frankfurt school sort of broadly um, but what I'm really keen to do is to do a follow up where because that was sort of a sort of collective biography, I suppose, uh, in many ways, uh, where I sort of told the story of the Frankfurt School as a sort of institution. I am really, really keen to uh, sort of follow that up by looking at critical theory and sort of looking at their ideas a, a little bit more. Uh, brilliant. Um, so everyone's saying hello. Someone can someone just confirm to me that you can both see me and hear me. That would be excellent. I'm 90% sure that everything is working, but it's always always good to have that confirmation, isn't it? Um, some uh, people have also been putting in uh, some thoughts about stuff that we can uh, chat about throughout the day. I've been making note of some of those just because uh, I'm aware that the chat doesn't hold on to them uh, for the whole time, uh, for the for the many hours in between me sort of posting the event and actually being live. So I've been noting uh, those down. Someone also sent me uh, an email with lots of thought, which was really excellent. Confirmed, says Brad MC, and no qualms says all good. So I'm assuming that means that uh, everyone can see and hear me. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. And the chat, which means this one, this thing I've been working on is also working, which is excellent. Um, so as I said last time, the sort of remit of these live streams is pretty broad. Um, and I'm really keen that uh, it's sort of depending on who's here. Oh dear, sorry. That depending on who's here, it goes in whatever direction uh, that, what you know, we discuss the things that uh, pe whoever's here want to discuss. Uh, amazing, we have 73 people currently watching, which is wonderful. I thought no one was going to turn up last time. This week, I thought maybe uh, all interest in it might have passed, but I'm even with there being very little uh, option of things to do uh, in a lot of the world at the moment, it is amazing to have some people around watching. Um, but yeah, so uh, although I'm keen for this to go in whatever direction it might do, uh, in fact, the sort of how long it lasts is pretty open. I'm imagining it being maybe around an hour again, but it might be slightly shorter, might be slightly longer, depending on what, what people want, how much there is to chat about. But my sort of main point for uh, discussion that I thought today was maybe to, some of you will hopefully have seen my uh, most recent video that I put out on Friday, where I took a little bit of a look at sort of academic writing and sort of debates over academic writing styles. Although I suppose in, in some regards the, the theme was actually academic reading, right? It was about uh, how academic writing or academic books, academic journal articles, academic papers can often be quite tough to engage with, right? They can be boring quite often or they can be in, in other ways um, sort of... Uh, difficult to comprehend, difficult to understand. And in that video, I sort of took a look at, um, you know, why might that be? What is it that makes academic writing difficult to engage with? 
Um, could it be different? Um, and should it be different? Or, or is there reasons for it uh, being uh, the way that it is? Uh, we'll go back to the chat very briefly. Um, has anyone, uh, anyone managed to watch that? I've, oh, I've got some interesting, uh, interesting uh, thoughts already and some brilliant questions as well. And we will come, we'll come, we'll come to those uh, uh, as well. Uh, uh, like what did I, what are some tips I wish I knew when I was starting in the academic world, which is, uh, yeah, really a, a, a good point. I think we'll, we'll come back to some of this stuff in a second. Um, w. Sindarius, uh, they're pointing out that a lot of academic writing today is rather banal and unremarkable, uh, but the poster child for dense writing might be Adorno's intro to negative dialectics. Uh, I have not actually uh, read Adorno's uh, intro to negative dialectics, so I cannot uh, offer much thought on that. But that was sort of the um, point that I wanted to start from with that video. Um, and to sort of explore, yeah, why might be this this be the case, uh, and uh, you know what might be what might be done about it, what should be done about it. And the point I sort of made uh, as I went through it was that um, actually a lot of academic writing is is difficult, sort of because the topics that it is discussing are difficult, um, and to sort of. Uh, that sometimes we sort of have to to level with that, and sometimes you know complex ideas require complex language was a point that uh, I made towards the end of the video. Um, but it's been really interesting over the last few days to see people's comments coming in. Like it's the the I, I always say that I'm really keen uh, for my videos to be the start of a conversation rather than the end of one. And it's always really interesting uh, hearing people. You know, some some people will be like, I oh, you know I like most of what you do on your channel, but this I wasn't quite so you know sure about. I disagreed in some ways with. Uh, and there was definitely uh, some some comments like that. Um, I think something that I, a point that I didn't make in that uh, video that I kind of wish maybe in retrospect that I put in was that I mean I hope from the content that I make on my channel particularly what the theory series I hope that it's obvious that I am very keen that academic ideas are sort of available and accessible to as many people as possible right I hope I hope that it is uh you know evident through my work that I I think it is uh, a sort of, you know, a, a education is a right in that sort of dogmatic sense, but also that I think that it's important for us to make ways for those who might not want to sit down and read uh, some of the sort of, you know, all the way through Pierre Bordeaux's uh, uh, distinction, for example, uh, that they should still be able to access some of the core ideas from within that, right? That uh, there should be a way of still being able to get one's head around the idea of economic capital, social capital, and cultural capital without having to read that whole book. And that's sort of what I try and do with my videos. So I think um, what I wish I'd done potentially is that I'd made that point a little bit clearer. And also a point that I wanted to make, which I didn't uh, get round to, was that I'm also really keen on, uh, I think there should be more opportunities or more instances of academics who are real like leaders in their fields actually writing specifically for general audiences, you know, non-academic audiences. And there sort of is instances of this. Um, David Harvey, for instance, his brief history of neoliberalism is pretty accessible and that's partly because it's written for a general audience and it's written in a slightly different tone and with different language than something like his uh, geographies of global capitalism, I think is, it's called, which is very much written in a slightly more academic register. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to see more instances of that. Um, and so when I was coming around to sort of defend academic writing for often being written for other academics, you know, it wasn't that I, I don't, you know, want people to be able to access uh, intellectual, intellectual ideas. Um, cool. Let's pop up the chat. In a second, I'm going to uh, give you a brief announcement is to oversell it, uh, but a, it's almost a, a brief favour that you could do me. But uh, I will tell you about that in a moment. Uh, lots of uh, lots of requests for my email. Um, so you can actually, if you, if you go to tomnicholas.com, uh, there are some contact details uh, on there where you can send me uh, some thoughts about what you see uh, on my channel. Uh, generally, I'm not able to get back to people that often. 
Um, from pretty early on of, of running my channel, I've had a lot of uh, sort of correspondence from people uh, either just going, you know, thanks, I, I watched that video of yours uh, and it helped me in some small way. Um, or going, here's a copy of my essay, could you read it and give me notes? And while I would absolutely love to be able to give people lots and lots of thoughts on their work, um, it's, it's generally just not something I'm able to uh, do because if I did it for everyone, uh, I wouldn't be, you know, I would sort of use all my time up, I'm afraid, and wouldn't be able to make any more videos, um, which would be a, a, a shame I think at least so apologies for that but you can you know please feel free to send me um thoughts about stuff you've seen on my channel I do, I do read them even if I'm not always able to get back to them uh brilliant uh lots of thoughts uh coming through and um, brilliant lots of thoughts about uh academic writing okay we're going to come back to this in about two seconds and we're going to take a look at some of these questions we're going to chat uh about uh, a little bit more about some of these points but there is one thing that uh, so whether you watch the last stream or not I'm aware that not everyone is able to uh, watch these videos uh, live uh, and I wanted to find a way of in fact I'll go back over here I wanted to find a way of uh, storing them so that they could be online so that people could watch them later uh, but from looking through a bunch of like YouTube stuff and chatting to other people who do uh, similar stuff to this. I know that having sort of live, lots of live stream videos hanging around on one's YouTube channel is uh, not particularly ideal. So what I have done is I've set up a slightly different uh, uh, YouTube channel, in fact a different YouTube channel, uh, just to store those. So particularly if you didn't um, catch my last live stream and if you would like to catch up on it you can find it by going to uh, Tom Nicholas Live. There's currently 12 subscribers. Some people obviously spotted the link that I put in the chat uh, before we actually went live tonight, which is amazing. Thank you for popping over there. Um, and if you uh, subscribe to that channel, then you'll be in the right place to watch any future live streams if you're not able to watch them live. I may also, at some point, if I get the sense that maybe having lots of live notifications popping up is um, irritating to people who just want to you know, watch videos that I've made where I've had time to think cogently about thoughts and put them together into a hopefully, uh, you know, coherent script, uh, which would be understandable if they just want to watch those videos, uh, then I might move the lives themselves over to this channel. Uh, but it's all a bit up in the air at the moment. This is all a big experiment uh, and I don't uh, know exactly uh, how the, what the future holds. But yes, if you would like to uh, make sure that you can catch up on older live streams, um, then do head over. If you search for Tom Nicholas Live, I believe, it won't be as uh, high up in the search uh, for you as it is currently for me because I'm already subscribed to it, but I think it should be like a little bit down the page. Although it's nice to see that after a few years of doing this, all my videos have uh, ended up there, which is nice. Um, excellent. Let's pop back to the chat and see what people are saying uh, and hopefully we can uh, answer some questions. Oh, we have over 100 people watching. That is uh, amazing. Thank you so much for all being here. I don't think we hit that bar last time. So this is more people, which is ridiculous. Um, amazing. So um, a bunch of thoughts about sort of lit reviews, writing literature reviews. Um, and so I'm aware, I, I possibly won't speak about this for ages and ages and ages because I'm aware this is possibly very relevant to some people and perhaps not relevant at all to others. Um, so uh, a literature review, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, is something that when you are writing a piece of academic work, so you're writing a PhD thesis, say maybe a master's, the uh, master's dissertation, um, is, or sometimes it might be a sort of set project uh, on other courses where you sort of want to summarize uh, a bunch of literature pertaining to a particular topic. Um, and in, in some regards, it's perhaps similar to an episode of What the Theory, although an episode of What the Theory is focused on um, a very specific topic. And uh, I don't always dig into the literature a huge, huge amount, but essentially it's a case of going like, you know, I'm writing this thesis and it's going to be, um, you know, in my case, writing my PhD, 
it sits in the intersection between theatre and geography and so I'm gonna sort of write about what is all the literature that already exists in that sort of bubble. Um, and so my my advice, um, which is tends to be advice that I repeat for a lot of things I think, um, is that I like to tell a story with stuff whenever I'm writing something. I hope with my What the Theory episodes, for instance, that in some ways I'm sort of writing a story about the topic at hand. That there's some kind of thread that runs through, whether that's time-based, and I often do tend to take like a sort of time-based, like, like with the Frankfurt School video when it was very much like, Frankfurt School's founded and we move through, or maybe even like my structuralism, post-structuralism videos, I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying, can't remember exactly now, but I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that I sort of start from like inception of that idea, follow it through development through time. Um, and that's usually the approach I take, but it, I think it's about finding some path through, uh, through that literature so that it makes some kind of sense. Because, you know, there are definitely ways of presenting um, uh, all the existing uh, scholarship and research that exists about a certain thing in a way that is just like, here's this topic, here's that topic. And that's not necessarily dreadful. It's not, doesn't, doesn't necessarily not do the job, but I don't know. I think that's, I come from a sort of storytelling. I come from a background of making theatre. And I think that, that therefore I've got that impulse to want to tell stories rather than just dump information. Um, but it will sort of depend on, uh, depend on, on you and the way you want to, to do it really. Um, and if you are doing a PhD, then I'm sure your uh, supervisor will be able to help you out and help you to find your way of doing that. Uh, let's pop back to the chat uh, and see what people are saying. Uh, thank you for the help, Tony. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, no, no offense taken. Uh, cool. Uh, what am I having? Uh, okay. If I'm seeking academic collaboration or something like that, is there a specific thing to put in the email heading or is it too much a time crunch? So I think if you're emailing, I think uh, academia is like anything that, um, you know, you don't know uh, whether people are going to want to work with you unless you ask sometimes. Um, so whoever it is that you're, um, Peter G, whoever it is that you are, are, you know, want to collaborate with, whether it's a, a professor of some description, um, I think it's a case of, uh, tapping that email out and um you know giving it giving it a risk i uh, over the last couple of days i sent off an email um about an article i wanted to write about something and you know thought there was potentially absolutely zero chance that uh, it was going to be a reality and uh, got an email back through today uh, suggesting that it might so you never know it's always worth uh, firing off uh, an email and finding out what else do we have uh Okay, are there, am I gonna go with that one? Uh, okay, let's go to, uh, let's go to the, la the very last one from Lucas Villeneuve Legler. I'm gonna take a quick drink. Uh, and it says, what is your opinion about the increasingly postmodern conceptual point of reference in the humanities nowadays? And this actually relates to a, a similar question that I think I had uh, a little bit earlier as well. I don't know whether it's still there in the chat or whether it's disappeared, but. for anyone who's new, just to show you off the new little ident. Uh, but, so the sort of postmodern uh, trend in uh, the humanities and academia, I think um, I think people, uh, it's, it's easy to uh, not, initially not get the right idea about what people are trying to express when they talk of postmodernism. Uh, I think particularly when you um, look at some of the ways in which it's discussed uh, in popular discourse, particularly in slightly more uh, right wing, to be potentially a bit generous uh, discourse. Um, th there's the sort of the idea that someone is or is not uh, a postmodernist or something is or is not postmodern. Whereas actually, and this will depend on approach, like we can certainly say that some artists, for example, take a postmodern approach to creating art. So for example, I will find, uh, I'll find uh, an example here. A very recent example is uh, a piece of art where an artist called, I mentioned this in one of my videos, but I can't remember 
what the name of the artist was called. Um, oh, Maurizio Catalan um, taped a banana to a wall uh, as part of a art exhibition in Florida. And we can definitely say that this is a postmodern approach to creating art, right? A, it engages in uh, the sort of idea of uh, found object art um, or everyday art where you are taking something that exists already in the world and asking whether that can be presented through a frame which constitutes it as art, right? Because Essentially, the thing which decides whether something is art or not is like its institutional context. So if I do a painting and put it on my wall um, and it, uh, you know, then potentially people aren't going to say that is some art. They're going to go, that's a bit of craft. That's a thing that Tom did, right? And just put on his wall. Um, it's the fact that something is presented in a gallery often which makes us go, oh, this is this is art, legitimate art, right? So there is um, a sort of postmodern approach that one can take to creating um, a piece of art, say. Um, but generally, and definitely how I see it, uh, when we talk of postmodernism post or the postmodern, what we're sort of talking about is a societal condition, okay? So we're talking um, less about an approach and more about... Um, uh, the idea that society has become increasingly sceptical, increasingly uh, sort of fractured in many ways, and um, that we have become, we've sort of moved away from uh, a notion that there is like objective truth in many senses. And I think it's, it's hard to argue that that's not the case, right? Um, Organised uh, religion, particularly in the advanced capitalist nations, is um, a much smaller uh, force than it once was. Uh, we disagree in a lot, right? We live in a, a, a post-truth world. Um, and that's the kind of world that uh, the ideas of postmodernism are trying to describe. Um, and so when we talk about, and particularly, um, I mean, you can uh, watch my video on postmodernism. Uh, it has awful sound because I made it when I was really, I mean, some people say I'm not very good at this still, but I made it when I really wasn't very good at doing all of this. Um, and so it has dreadful, dreadful, dreadful sound. Um, but if you can suffer through that, then I'd maybe suggest going and watching it. There's definitely bits I do differently if I made it again now, and I might redo it at some point. But um. A lot of the idea of postmodernism emerges sort of post uh, Second World War, um, where sort of we'd had the world had seen a lot of uh, totalizing political movements, right? Which said the problems with the world is this, uh, the answers is this, the answers are this. Um, oh, very quickly, I think I've seen that I had a uh, super chat. But and very quickly go to the chat just to acknowledge that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Drew Griffin. Uh, for your super chat. Uh, I've not got anything flashy that I can have pop up on the screen for these just yet. Maybe I'll work on something for the future. Uh, if you would like to contribute to the uh, future life of the channel, but don't want to commit to something regularly on Patreon, um, that's amazing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Drew. Uh, and the rose is lovely too. Uh, but yeah, so so after, after the Second World War, we get a lot of this sort of just scepticism arrived arising in society, right? Um, big, uh, totalizing political ideas, like um, uh, from fascism to communism to everywhere in between had been tried and had led to some really devastating um, effects. And so people began to be slightly less uh, keen or less up for engaging with the world um, in such a, a way that sort of su suggested that here are the truths about the world and here are the problems with it and here's how we're going to fix them and became came to sort of criticise a lot of those things, whether it's institutions, um, in much the same way that that piece of art by Maurizio Catalan critiques uh, the institution uh, of the art gallery. Um, and so although people like to go like, this person's a postmodernist, this person's a postmodernist, it kind of doesn't necessarily cohere with what that term is trying to do. It's more trying to explain a societal condition rather than a, an approach. Although we can talk about a post-structuralist approach, 
very definitely and those two things are very linked but um I've talked about that for ages already. So uh, I'll go back to the chat and see what people are talking about. Um, so yeah, Banana uh, Das is suggesting that uh, postmodernism is really criticised these days. I mean, yeah, that's the sort of uh, point that I'm making. It tends to come from a point of view uh, where I don't think there's necessarily a, a whole grasp of what's being discussed. Uh Cool. Uh, smoke and steam, sort of going back to uh, the sort of uh, question of sort of academic writing, uh, suggesting that a lot of academic writing purposefully closes itself off. Um, it's aimed at the academy and remains trapped within. Of course, some ideas are complex, are challenges to bring them uh, to life. And I think, yeah, this is sort of... Um, I mean, there was some really interesting comments to to my last video, and um, particularly there was one or two uh, people that were like, hello, yes, I'm an academic. Um, a lot of us just aren't very good at writing. And I think that's a really interesting like take on it that actually, um, you know, I'm currently working my way through, uh, hopefully getting to the end of, of a PhD and through the process of like learning to be an academic, there isn't a huge amount of like writing training. All of the training and sort of education element is mostly focused on uh, developing your research skills. And the, the presentation bit is, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's some guidance. I think it'd be ridiculous to suggest that there's none, but is, um, you know, sort of a bit more light handed. Um, and so, yeah, there was lots of people in my uh, in the comments to that last video just suggesting that actually a lot of academics just aren't good writers. And that's, you know, that's one thing that they're maybe good at teaching, maybe good at research, but aren't good at that thing. That's the, uh, one point. Um, but I think it's uh, for me, much of the argument I tried to make in that video was that actually there is a need sometimes for academic uh, academics to be able to communicate uh, within that bubble and actually stuff happening within that bubble isn't always a bad thing we definitely want there to be points at which ideas come out and are explained to people um you know in a, a way that i hopefully try and do on my channel um but that sometimes it's really useful actually for ideas to be able to ferment um at that really sort of higher level uh thinking uh place and so that sometimes that's useful but yeah i agree that we also want to sort of also draw those ideas out uh, into into the world where uh, people that don't have uh, academic training in whatever the topic at hand is are able to uh, learn about them, right? In the last few weeks, it feels like months, but it's probably been weeks, we've all been learning a, a lot about epidemiology uh, as uh, the sort of present virus has spread through the world. And most of the time, we would not be able to engage with the uh, conversations that epidemiologists are having surrounding uh, all manner of things, um, pandemics notwithstanding. Um, but uh, at this point in time, it's very useful for us all to be able to, to sort of know what the knowledge being developed uh, there is. But without there occasionally being those bubbles for the academics to work on that kind of stuff and scientific researchers that work on that stuff and um, to discuss those things, the knowledge might not be where it's at. I hope that sort of makes sense uh, in some way or another. I'm also going to very briefly go over to... I had a... Um, a bunch of ideas come through earlier and I'm sure there was at least one that I was very, very keen to get to and I can't uh, remember. Um, I mean, so someone called Ramsey uh, dropped a message on the chat uh, a little while ago, uh, far prior to us actually going live, um, to ask about uh, sort of imagistic writing, is the way he put it, uh, or they put it, um, about the, uh, the uh, particularly within the humanities, um, and sort of comparing some of the work of like, say, an Adorno or, uh, Walter Benjamin, I think, was the other person that came up. Um, and, you know, whether if they were within a uh, tw uh, 2020 context in a UK or US university, would they be able to put out the same kind of very illusionary, very uh, metaphor, simile related uh, sort of engage? So sort of use would they be able to write in a way that uses quite so much uh, metaphor? and uh, simile and uh, all these allusions um, to uh, other works of art and stuff to write. Um, and I'm not really sure. I don't know whether I'm necessarily in the best place to 
answer that question, but I would say I have uh, read a fair bit less of that kind of work that has been from more recent years. And I am sort of aware that it's probably the kind of stuff that I would choose to engage with less. So it's possibly that I've not sort it out in quite the same way. Um, and also I tend to, my own research tends to fall within a slightly more um, materialistic um, or sort of cultural materialism uh, space where actually it's very much about what are the things that exist in the world, where is the money going, what are the social and political forces happening, rather than in that um, uh, slightly more, uh, rather than in that space of wanting to discuss the ideas that are in people's heads. I've not really explained that quite so well. Um, but but I suppose I've, I've, I'm currently working on an episode of What the Theory um, to give you all a bit of a uh, insight into what's coming uh, in the future. Um, currently working on an episode of What the Theory on uh, psychoanalysis, which very much sits miles away from what I usually do. Um, and I would I would imagine there is still that kind of writing going on. Um, it's possibly just that it doesn't exist in the kind of academic spaces that I seek out, I suppose. Although there is there is potentially an argument that um, the rise of things like in my last video, I talked about the research excellence framework, which is a thing in the UK where uh, universities have all the scholarship that their academics have put out sort of sort of their sort of a bunch of academics look at it again and it gets marked and there's potentially the case that that kind of thing um makes that sort of writing be able to thrive slightly less um cool i'm gonna go back to our uh chat see what people are saying if you've just got here i'm gonna give you this task uh once again i'm also gonna go and see how it got on but um, so this is the second of these live streams. Uh, welcome back to those of you who have uh, who uh, were not here. Welcome back. Welcome back to those of you who were here last time. Uh, welcome for the first time to those of you who uh, weren't. Um, yeah, we're sort of vaguely talking today about uh, academic writing, but also with a sort of broad net that actually brings stuff up in the chat. I'm going to go back to it in a minute and we can talk about whatever it is you guys have got on your mind, what you want to ask sort of burning questions about. I am really keen that these live streams go in whatever direction uh, the people that are there at a, on a given day want them to. Uh, but what I have said is if you didn't manage to catch uh, our last live stream, if you uh, unfortunately missed out on that one i have uh set up a new youtube account where i'm gonna put all of the old ones so that those who aren't able to make it or missed out in some way you can catch up on them uh and the way you can find it is by going to uh if you go to or oh do my keyboard has shut down uh, if you go to youtube uh type in uh tom nicholas live uh then it should uh, pop up. Oh, we have 25, 25 subscribers now. Thank you to those of you who have gone over uh, and uh, subscribed to that. It is also really useful because once it hits 100, I can give it like a custom URL so that I can more easily direct people to it. Um, but and this is the place where uh, there will be uh, sort of old live streams that I've done uh, that you can catch up on uh, to your heart's content and at your leisure. Cool. Uh, but... Oh dear, I didn't mean to do it in that order. I meant to do the other thing first. Let's go to, uh, back to the chat. Uh, am I a lecturer at a university? Uh, I'm not uh, presently, so I'm currently uh, just finishing off a PhD. Um, and, uh, but, but as part of that, I do some teaching uh, at uh, the University of Exeter, where I'm doing my PhD, uh, and I lead some seminar groups. And in actual fact, one of the comments I got earlier um, before I'd, uh, started doing all this was that I got a, uh, a comment from someone who was asking who themselves was doing a PhD and was asking a little bit about actually what's it like to uh, teach undergrads whilst you're doing a PhD um, and I think it's also a question that I found my own students that I work with asking too because it's not necessarily the I think when you start university you don't necessarily expect to have other people who are sort of described as students teaching you um, or people that are still studying. Um, 
and I mean, I find it really uh, exciting as a um, as a, a PhD student. I, I like the fact that alongside doing the research, I also get to spend time with students. Um, uh, and I particularly find I've done a lot of teaching of like first year modules where we're looking at some really key concepts, um, perhaps the kind of stuff that comes up in my what the theory videos. And I find it really exciting, like introducing people to that stuff for the first time, like I hope, uh, you know, hope shows on, on my channel as well. Uh, and I find it really reinvigorates my desire to to want to think about the world in the new way in new ways, and also um, the way that uh, students often make you rethink um, your response to ideas uh, that you'd sort of just grown really accustomed to. Um, so I, so I really really enjoyed it. It takes a lot of time, but you know potentially I could have been spending sitting at my computer here uh writing my phd itself um so you know there's there's that trade-off but um i adore teaching in person um i also uh i recently got to go to uh germany which is amazing um someone got uh, in touch with me uh, having seen some of my videos and uh uh, asked me to go over to a university in Germany to uh, teach uh, a seminar there, which was fantastic. So if any of you are lecturers or um, have lecturers you think would be amenable to persuading, uh, do please, uh, you know, see if you can ha have me over. That would be amazing. <laughs> um, uh, I will give you whatever, whatever knowledge uh, I can try and find in the back of my brain. Uh, so uh, see what people are saying. Um, people are mentioning Frederick Jameson's uh, postmodernism, the cultural logic of late capitalism, which is sort of the, uh, you know, I, I, idea that I was trying to uh, bring up a moment ago. Um, that idea that postmodernism is less an approach and is more... Um, I mean, as Jameson says, the cultural logic of the, the world as it exists in the present day. I also want to point out that we currently have 110 people here, um, which is 111 now, which is beyond my wildest dreams of the amount of people that would have engaged uh, even in the first of these streams, let alone the second. So thank you so much all uh, for being here. It is an absolute uh, pleasure to have you. Uh, any research writing books that I'd recommend? Uh, there's been a lot of threads recently from grad students being... Okay, I'm going to do the second point because I'm not sure there is necessarily any particular... Uh, this is a question from Mr. Volgrim. I'm not sure that... I'm not sure I do have any at the front of my mind for research writing books that I'd recommend. Um, uh, sorry, you'll have to ask someone different for, for the answer to that question. Um, but... Uh, but I will uh, take a look a little point, look at your second point, which is that a lot of there's a lot of threads recently, I'm guessing on, on Twitter potentially, um, from grad students being discouraged from continuing their activities in academia due to uh, employment and uh, issues. Uh, and yeah, that's that's very much uh, the case. I mean, um, so over the last bunch of years, uh, universities, uh, and this is probably a, a thing of decades rather than like, you know, four years or something, but. Um, universities have been having more and more and more um, PhD students coming through because it's it's good for them on a whole number of different ways. It looks really good um, on in terms of their metrics, like it makes you look like a really good university if you've got lots of PhD students. At the same time as having less and less uh, lecturers working for them, which means that there's more people who can compete for jobs, less people, uh, less jobs to apply for. Um, yeah, I'm getting towards the end of my PhD, and it is going to be a uh, a, a dog fight to try and get a job I think um but I'm glad to sort of have this and um if an academic job isn't a possibility uh continuing to do this if if uh, this can become a bigger part of what I what I do as part of my work um I'm also totally happy with that like I really really enjoy uh making educational videos for people and also making these video essays where I'm sort of a bit more like I'm gonna make an argument uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, it's not, it's not an ideal world if you presently want to get a job in academia. Um, although I would argue for the process of doing a PhD, I have also found really, uh, enlightening and challenging, um, and great in so many other ways, regardless of whether the end product of it is a job. Um, I think, I mean, I think I'd be a very different human being without having done it, um, uh, you know, with, without anything else at least 
Um, cool. Uh, brilliant. I forget if you covered him before, but what do you think of Baudria? Um, so I've done, I think I've done a very brief snippet on Baudria. Um, I think there was a little bit within my postmodernism video, I want to say. He's definitely come up, at least. I can't remember. I think I've definitely mentioned simulacrum or simulacra before, um, but I can't remember exactly where. It might have come up in one of my um, Society of the Spectacle or sort of capitalism, capitalist realism videos, uh, but I can't quite remember. Um, it's been quite a while since I've read any, either any Bojo himself or any of the work that engages with uh, his work. But um, I definitely remember the first time that I took a look at the Gulf War will not take place, the Gulf War is not taking place, the Gulf War did not take place. So for those of you that aren't aware, um, uh, during the first Gulf War, which I can't remember what year was that, can anyone let me know in the chat what year is that? Uh, and it would be very, uh, it'd be very helpful. Maybe someone else can Google for me what time, what uh, year the uh, first Gulf War was. But uh, both prior, well, prior to, during and after, Jean Baudrillard wrote uh, these articles about uh, the Gulf War uh, and uh, sort of suggesting that it, it, it was not actually taking place and that it sort of wasn't a war. Um, and looking at how the idea of war had sort of been constructed in political discourse. And it was, it, they're really interesting. They're, you, I think it's potentially worth, if you're going to read them in 2020 um, and have no knowledge of that uh, era of history at all, it is perhaps worth taking a quick, uh, you know, look at it and getting some context. But I think his way of engaging with the world is really, really interesting. Um, and... Uh, yeah, some of the some of the ideas that that you find in OGR are just really, um, I don't know, just just do give you that um, new way of looking at the world that you often want when you're engaging with academic ideas, uh, and it's yeah. So I, uh, it's been a while since I read any of his work, so I can't necessarily say what I think of him without really reaching back into my mind, but um, but yeah, I have been a fan in the past, and I can imagine that means I'm I'm still a a, a, a fan uh, chat 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 uh, it's great 115 people it's amazing uh, uh, Operation Desert Storm was 1990 to 1991 uh, thank you uh, Jamie von Schwarzberg uh, and also Bubble Boy and also Mike Anderson thank you everyone uh, clearly uh, grabbed the same uh, uh, either, either thought of it or, or found the, the information at the same time. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, I've not read any Catherine uh, Bell Belzy, uh, so I can't tell you what I'm think uh, about her work. But I would uh, let me know in in a second uh, what she's written about. Be, be cool. Uh, uh, let's have a look. Just so many amazing. I do sort of struggle to keep up with these a little bit. Um, uh, someone's asked, so sort of continuing our discussion of postmodernism, and this is really interesting that there's been a bit of a theme to our discussions. Maybe it's just the things that have popped, um, you know, popped out to my eye when I've been reading the chat, and maybe there's been lots and lots and lots of other stuff. But um, it's really interesting that there's been another uh, theme to uh, the stream this time round. I think last time there was very much a theme. I'm trying to think what kept popping up. Uh, we started very much looking at like manufacturing consent. Someone was bringing up um, sort of Fox News and some ideas around that. And then we definitely ended up with a bit of a, a through line of the stuff that was being discussed. Oh, definitely like the Marvel Cinematic Universe came up a lot. Um, ideas of uh, sort of, and yeah, those sort of ideas of like cultural hegemony, uh, which was fascinating. This time we're definitely on a bit of a like postmodernism uh, uh, discussion, which is absolutely excellent um and chropi21 uh, however one would like to uh, put that together as a word has uh, asked is postmodernism more anachronistic as a term applied after the fact um and 
not not really it sort of emerges i'm trying to think when um the term itself first pops up we definitely have sort of a period of sort of hot what's often referred to as high modernism where um uh so in artistic terms uh modernism tends to refer to uh, artistic movements where and they were often like movements where people were trying to expand the idea of what art was and um, so something like um, cubism say Picasso's cubism is a pretty uh, sort of classic example of modernism where uh, you know Picasso was like drawing people in a normal, you know, in, in a sort of photorealistic manner. Um, that does not do it for me. I'm going to find this new way of doing it. And I think I can make art better by um, adopting cubism. Uh, and we can uh, see a whole bunch of different movements like that that emerge at a certain point in time. Um, some of the like key modernist uh, sort of novels might be, say, uh, I mean, James Joyce's Ulysses. Uh, say which I've made a video of if anyone would like to read if you are locked inside uh, it's challenging but it is I, I got a lot out of it reading Ulysses um, and, uh, and and through Ulysses basically what Joyce does is for each different chapter in the book he takes a completely different uh, approach to uh, how he writes so there'll be a certain style to one chapter and then the next chapter will often take like a completely different style so one uses loads and loads of onomatopoeia um, and then like another chapter is all uh, sort of stream of consciousness so it just sort of like rattles through thoughts and um, another chapter is set in a, a newspaper office so there'll be like a headline every so often and then it'll be written in a very um sort of journalistic fashion and already at that point you're sort of getting towards a sort of high modernism where um the very where people are experimenting with uh style artistic style so much that it's obvious that the very notion of there being any kind of like perfect artistic style is ridiculous because you can so easily jump between them um uh and, and sort of postmodernism uh, emerges uh I think did sort of emerge at a time when it was also being described a little bit. So I wouldn't um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily anachronistic in the sense that we only now label uh, things postmodern whilst looking back at them. Um, there's a lot of, you know, there's some discussion in some circles of academia where um, people are, you know, asking, you know, what comes next? What comes after postmodernism? Um, and actually I get a bunch of comments like, could you do a video on X thing, which someone has suggested is like, I think there's like a thing called like metamodernism, which some people have suggested is like the follow up to uh, postmodernism. Um, I'm generally of the opinion, and not that it necessarily matters what I think, but that we're probably still in that postmodern stage in many ways. Although we have sort of started to revert to a slightly more, uh, uh, sort of more extreme politics. I think it's definitely the case that um, that politics has opened up in many ways over uh, recent years and that the uh, window, uh, who refers to the, uh, I'm trying to think what the, uh, Overton window, sorry, the Overton window has sort of expanded uh, over recent years. Um, and so yeah, maybe there's something in that which suggests we're coming into a, a slightly different place. Um, there's definitely a lot of writing in sort of British cultural theory um, and British cultural studies around the idea of like the long 1990s, which sort of borrows this idea from historians where they often refer to the 19th century as the long 19th century, because a lot of the cultural ideas that we sort of associate with the 19th century uh, began, um, I can't, I'm not entirely sure, this is, history is not my topic, but began a little bit before or, or ended a little bit after. And so like the 19th century is a little bit longer than, uh, you know, the actual uh, amount of time that is demarcated by the, the 19th century. And so, um, so, you know, some cultural theorists have sort of wrestled with this idea and drawn it into the present and asked whether a lot of the cultural norms and particularly like political ideas, the idea of particularly like a post-politics, which we associate with the 1990s, actually continued 
um, for quite a long time afterwards. Although we might have initially thought that the events of like September um, the 11th or the uh, Iraq War, the Second Gulf War, um, to link us back to earlier, um, might have really uh, thrown things up a little bit. Actually, um, the uh, actually a lot of those ideas persisted. I would say potentially until maybe 2016, and um, because it did feel that uh, 2016 was like this big year um, where an awful lot of things uh, changed, and we had like uh, I mean, and and this is coming from a very uh, Anglo-American uh, well view on the world, right? So we had um, uh, Trump was elected in America. Brexit happened in the uh, UK and it did feel like the emergence of a slightly different political era where we go from having politicians who are very much like slightly managerial maybe and sort of revel in the idea that they are, um, uh, you know, that they look statesperson like and they um, and that most of politics is decided already. We just need to make a few little adjustments here and there. And that sort of actually extended sort of through Obama um, and through sort of uh, David Cameron in the UK, um, all the way until that 2016 period, I would suggest now that we've perhaps shifted somewhere. Uh, how that is described, though, is sort of up for grabs. I think postmodernism uh, and the sort of ideas around that, as well as being super, super useful, also occasionally attract uh, a slightly hipster crowd. And I think there's the potential that there's a slightly like, hipster part of uh, academia or, or sort of academics who like really want to be the first person to coin the next term um which uh you know so, so i'm potentially a little bit skeptical of trying to come up with the term uh and whether one is necessarily needed just yet uh cool i'm gonna go back to the chat um what i'm gonna do is my voice is absolutely dying i'm out of water uh, I'm not going to stop the stream just yet because we've still got loads and loads of people around. We have 105 people still around, which is absolutely amazing. Thanks so much to all of you for being here. I'm going to... Um, that sounds very end of history, Shane. Um, exactly. That's the sort of thing that uh, uh, that I'm talking about. That idea um, that, uh, you know, yeah, we've decided the main stuff. We just need to tweak out the, tweak out the bits and bobs. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to quickly run and uh, grab some water. I will be like... Uh, very few moments. Uh, whilst I'm doing that, if you have yet to uh, go over to uh, go to YouTube, uh, if you so basically, if you want to catch, uh, if if you think you're going to maybe miss some of these streams, you want to catch up on them later, you can head over to Tom Nicholas Live uh, by searching for Tom Nicholas Live. It'll probably be much further down your search than it is mine because I've already searched and clicked on it a few times today. Uh, oh, that's me, live now. I am indeed. Uh, click on it. Uh, if you subscribe to it, that means that if you miss any of these streams, you'll be able to catch up on them later. And also I potentially might move the streams over there uh, at some point. Thank you to the people that have already done that. You are absolutely amazing. Of course, uh, the other thing you could do would be to, uh, sign up to my Patreon if that was also a thing you wanted to do. Um, the details are flashing up on your screen now. Um, but I'm going to go and grab some water. Oh, thank you so much uh, to El Elon Kilon for um, for the super... That's called a super sticker, I think, not a super chat. And that was also what whoever gave me a, a super thing earlier did. So thank you so much for uh, to Elon Kilon uh, for doing that. That's very, very... Uh, uh, that, that's amazing. Thank you. It's so kind. And it does really help to keep the channel going. Okay. I'm going to uh, be back in two seconds.
Hello everyone, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I do apologise. <laughs> um, uh, I should be back and you should be able to hear me. Is that possible? Fix your mic, says Maria. Um, thank you. Uh, Bubba Pepper says, when the professor leaves the mouse over the play pause button. I am, I'm, I'm in, I'm very much enjoying your, uh, uh, ribbing of me. No sound, says Robert Bromley. Um, let someone, if someone could let me know that it definitely is working now, because it should be. Uh, Eric Border is saying, hey, which is either that he's just arrived here or that the microphone's now working again. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, everyone. Um, one of the really useful things about the live chat function, as well as meaning that we can all, uh, that we can all sort of chat to each other, is partly that thing of like, it's quite useful having be, people be able to confirm that everything is working. Um, thank you so much for uh, uh, confirming that to me as well. So yeah, we, so sorry, someone asked about the idea of like a post-liberalism. Um, and I was suggesting uh, that, uh, oh, Eric Board is still saying no, but lots of people, lots of people saying yes. Maria said, I'm nice, but you wouldn't listen. Oh, thank you. No, I I appreciate your directness. It was very important that I knew the microphone wasn't working. So thank you. It's a totally acceptable occasion to be like, so I'll oh, thank you, Ben Rice, as well, for um, telling me that it is definitely working now. Um, but someone was asking in the chat, I forget who. Oh, my goodness, I need to forget, remember to turn those things off after I uh, <laughs> use them, um, about uh, the idea of a sort of post-liberalism. Um, and I feel like there's probably a more um, coherent body of academic literature that exists around this topic that I'm potentially not super uh, aware of or engaged in. But, I mean, it definitely felt, there was definitely a, a period where it felt like, I mean, as Francis Fukuyama argues in um, The End of History uh, and The Last Man, um, a, definitely a period in which it felt like there was kind of this idea of liberal democracy and capitalism um, that was the centre of, of everything. And it's kind and, and that, uh, you know, as we've, as we've been saying in the stream earlier, that sort of most of politics was fixed. We just needed to sort of iron out the edges a little bit. And some of that stuff um, is also stuff that ideas surrounding postmodernism engage with, right? Because um, in Baudrillard's terms, maybe um, it means that politics, instead of being politics becomes like a simulacra of politics, right? You can vote, but the choices that you make potentially don't make a huge, huge amount of difference. Um, and there was definitely a period it through what I was referring to before the break uh, as the sort of long 1990s, where it felt like that was the case. Um, a lot of the more left wings uh, parties in um, a lot of the advanced capitalist nations had sort of moved to the right on their economic policy. Um, some, though not all, of the uh, more conservative uh, political parties or mainstream conservative political parties, um, uh, at least, had sort of moved uh, a little bit to the left on their um, sort of more cultural policies, say. Um, and the, that was sort of the, the guiding principle um, from uh, Tony Blair uh, through Bill Clinton to uh, Obama and... Um, uh, yeah, that, that was sort of the guiding political uh, ideology of the time. Um, but uh, that there was definitely a point a few years ago where that started to not uh, be the case. Um, and I'm just uh, quickly also just checking. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, Banana uh, Das is just right, uh, written again, sort of about post-liberalism. Thank you. And it was you that mentioned it last time. Um, but where there started to sort of be... Uh, a pushback against that, right? So um, I definitely think like uh, 2016 or, or sort of the years leading up to 2016 um, is a real example of that, right? So you have the, the sort of the Tea, tea Party merge in America um, and sort of uh, parties like uh, uh, UKIP in the UK, um, the uh, Front uh, Front National, what's it called? Uh, I can't think what it's called in France, but... Um, uh, where that sort of slightly, uh, starts to change. Um, Richard here in the chat is saying that, do I think it uh, was the financial crisis that um, could have shaken us out of the end of history? And I think that's definitely part of it, right? There's definitely um, a part of it was that there was that huge um, shake-up of the financial system. A lot of people who 
um, were previously okay off um, suddenly were not okay off and potentially like lost their jobs, um, lost their mortgages potentially and their houses. I think there's also, I don't think it's all down to that. I think the rise of a lot of those sort of uh, slightly more left-wing movements, so potentially um, like the uh, sort of Jeremy Corbyn Labour Party in the UK, the sort of Bernie Sanders and, and more general ship move uh, for Medicare for All in the US um, and similar political parties elsewhere in the world. I think that probably does come from the... Uh, just that shock of the financial crisis in 2008. I mean, there's a lot of the language of, say, uh, Occupy that comes through uh, that. Um, Catherine Cycle saying, take a look at Ecuador uh, this week. Uh, uh, the Front National, yeah, sorry, Alonso uh, perez Fragu says as well. I mean, yeah, Rich saying in Occupy in 2011, like, uh, which is really interesting, I think, the way that a lot of Occupy wasn't overly successful in achieving its aims but we do still see the language of that movement permeating throughout our political uh, discourse right the idea of like the the one percent um but uh, and so i think a lot of that element of stuff probably does stem from just the shock of the uh, financial crash in 2008 um but i don't know whether the sort of more reactionary elements of stuff necessarily does um, in fact, there is a great article, it's going to pop up with that thing again, sorry, I'm going to turn it off for next time uh, so that it doesn't always come up with uh, my name, um, but I will, now that one's played, I'll just play the Patreon one just, just to complete the complete the look, um, but uh, I think some of the more reactionary stuff doesn't necessarily come directly from that, um, in fact, there's uh, so there's a publisher, I know someone in the chat a moment ago was mentioning uh, zero books which is like a, a publisher which um, publishes primarily like political books uh, from a, a generally left-wing perspective um, someone was discussing them in the um, uh, in the live chat um, and there's uh, another publisher who's great is verso books which are probably a little bit more established and I would generally say are a little bit more sort of finished in what they put out um, zero books put out a lot of stuff uh, a little bit very quickly it sometimes feels but um so anyway first books are slightly more established uh, is the important point um and they're currently publishing a bunch of articles about uh sort of uh sort of what does uh socialism in the uk look like post uh post Jeremy corbyn and one of those was written by a uh chap called owen hathley uh which i read the other day in actual fact i'm gonna find it for you now and it looks at sort of the idea. So it looks at it through. Uh, I don't know if uh, people have. Uh, I'm sure some of you will have heard of the Smiths, surely, who are a uh, sort of British uh, band. Or was I want to look at the Smiths, who are a British band uh, from the uh, 1980s uh, with Morrissey as their lead singer. Um, and so basically, at the moment, they're right, uh, publishing all these essays. And Ern Hathaway wrote this one about. Um, uh, uh, the Smiths, but using the Smiths as sort of a way to think about a particular generation's uh, and geographically cited community's journey through politics uh, over the past few decades. Um, and the sort of nostalgia. So I think in the UK, definitely some of this stuff stems from a kind of second war nostalgia, um, particularly the like slightly more nationalistic stuff. Um, but he sort of argues that it's not necessarily a uh, nostalgia for the Second World War, but for a more generalised sense of suffering, particularly um, for, and I know in previous videos I've sort of argued against too much of a generational way of looking at politics, but he particularly um, argues that, particularly for that kind of like baby boomer generation who have generally done quite well out of, uh, out of society in the past little while, um, that there's sort of a desire to still want to be able to claim that mantle of of suffering um which is interesting given that one of the um sort of accusations that's often thrown is uh you know they don't like people acting the victim uh, but the the argument there is that sort of you know they want to reclaim that idea uh <laughs> meat free gammon says ben rice um uh, ben rice says ah, ha 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 morrissey 
um bisquick says verso books was it yes yeah it was uh, verso books i'm talking about um who did at least a little a few days back have um some kind of uh sale on i think when they uh were sort of giving away some at least ebooks of some of the stuff that they were um uh, that they've got out at the moment but worth worth checking out they've got some really really good books um i'm gonna take another drink of water because uh we've gone all the way for an hour and 10 minutes um and there's still more than 100 people here thank you so much to all of you for being here um but uh yeah so uh arguing for that idea of going back for some uh, sense of nostalgia. I can't quite remember. Oh, we were talking about post-liberalism. That was how we got here. So I don't think that the um, on the right, that sort of shift to the right is necessarily, um, comes from the 2008 financial crisis in quite the same way that I think the stuff on the left probably does. Um, so yeah, and actually someone just said in the comment, someone who I'm assuming is, is not here to be a big fan, uh, uh, Project Malice also saying that we have we've done the longest stream out of two. This one is the longest. Well done uh, to everyone who's here for keeping me going. Um, uh, so, yeah, someone who I'm guessing is not a fan was saying uh, like Corbynism isn't nostalgic. And I think, yeah, there is clearly an element uh, of nostalgia to that. But It's interesting what one is being nostalgic for, right? I'm gonna take your comment on it on on, on its uh, sort of on its words. Um, I think it's interesting to look at the difference of what is being um, sort of longed for, right? That um, actually the era that lots of uh, the people that sit in that sort of have maybe done the um, UKIP to Brexit party to Conservative party sort of pipeline over recent years. Um, that sort of particularly slightly older generation who have uh, got this sort of, you know, want to have a bit of blitz spirit. They want that. They've got that sort of nostalgia for the past. It's interesting that um, the era that they're often quite nostalgic for is one of sort of social democracy, uh, very much of the kind of program that uh, the, the Labour Party, at least over the last few years, has offered. Um, and so, ask, so, so it's interesting to ask that question of like, actually actually uh what is it that you're being nostalgic for right that was an era and in fact not you know 1979 was the um most equal year i think in terms of like the genie coefficient which um i think is only actually uh based around income inequality which um in actual fact is not the best way of measuring inequality because um if any of you have read uh uh, Thomas Piketty's uh, Capital in the 21st Century, um, you know, actually it's inequalities of capital which are the, the, the biggest thing because capital always uh, grows at a fast, generally at a faster um, rate than uh, incomes. But um, uh, but yeah, it's interesting that if, if those are the years that you're nostalgic for, why don't you like the um, uh, political, you know, the political programme that is being offered? Um, and it's potentially because it's a pretty reactionary um nationalistic kind of uh nostalgia where it's it's the cultural stuff that is being uh, longed for the sort of uh yeah even if probably none of that is quite as accurately remembered as it uh as it is thought to have been uh cool let's go back to the uh, yeah, Rick, richard saying british boomer in new year i can never pronounce that word is fascinating um and yeah the uh, 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 yeah, particularly Jeff <laughs> Morrissey is just a, an interesting character, isn't he? Um, uh, there was also a good point here, um, so sort of going back to the academic writing point, um, that Eric Border is saying about um, would I have something to say as someone who's British about the so-called hegemony of the English language in social sciences and its impact on national intellectual traditions, um. Uh, and also hi uh, to Joe, uh, who is watching. Uh, hello, hope you're well. Um, I mean, this is sort of something that I can't necessarily comment on a huge amount because I guess I benefit from that, uh, that sort of hegemony of the English language, uh, right? But I'm sure that it is um, massively uh, not, not a great thing, right? If that is not your first language, that you either publish in your language and it, 
it um I mean, it's all like uh, continuing ramifications of colonialism, right? That uh, the, the, the English language is viewed as like the legitimate language to publish in. It's often viewed as the global language, although that's, you know, far from the case. Um, and in fact, there's, there's different spheres of uh, uh, different scholarship. Like the writing of Henri de Fervre, for instance, really starts to... Um, impact sort of global thinking um, after the time it's uh, sort of translated into uh, English which also always is interesting to me that it did it had to have been done that before but um uh, but yeah I can't really comment a huge amount on that because obviously I sort of benefit in many ways but I can imagine that must be awful in fact it used to be the case and it is still um, in some other countries I believe that you, when if you did a PhD, you also had to learn a second language, and I'm pretty sure that was the case in um, some English-speaking countries as well. With the idea being that you had to be able to engage with uh, academic literature and ideas which exist in at least one other uh, language to your own, um, which is kind of cool. I'm not sure where I'd have found the time to do it while I was, what, what you know, I would have found the time to do it since I've been studying, but. Um, <laughs> but uh yeah it's kind of cool i'd have kind of liked part of me would have liked the um you know bump up the arse to learn a uh, new language on we sorry yeah james uh, james von schwarzberg reminding me that sort of on we is the e-n-u-i word that i could not pronounce earlier a bottle of signy hello thank you for coming back you are often commenting uh, on my videos and uh, we're here last time so thank you for uh, showing up once again is asking oh dear it's gone it's gone where did it go about how to keep up motivation it was um particularly given that uh, everyone's uh, uh there's been a lot of cancellations i'm guessing let me know over there but um has there been lots of have lots of people who are studying at some level i'm guessing had their courses cancelled um, I'll have to wait because there, there's a bit of a delay between the video coming through my camera and going uh, out to you. But um, uh, because, yeah, that's going to be really tough to try and stay really engaged with studying what you're studying um, and trying to. Um, I mean, some uh, some people who uh, are doing uh, programs of study in the UK, I know, have actually had uh, like a lot of stuff cancelled. Um, like maybe the exams have been cancelled and they're actually going to get the mark that they've currently got, which is obviously great if you were doing really well so far, is less good if you were hoping that the bits in the next term were going to really bump up your scores. Um, and I mean, to anyone is going to be quite disappointing, I think, because, you know, you've worked, no matter how well you thought you were going to do on an exam, um, you know, you've worked really hard for it. And so you kind of want the payoff of doing it. I know I was working with some um, school kids on a project and uh, they were saying the same, like, you know, they don't particularly want to do their uh, GCSEs or whatever. And they um, maybe weren't super, super confident about how well they're going to do, but they'd done all the work and so sort of wanted to be able to at least put that into, you know, see how they did. Um, uh, yeah, but I was thinking saying all first year undergraduate exams at SOAS, that's the uh, School of Oriental and Asian Studies, I want to say, in uh, London, are cancelled and getting marks based on essays previously uh, handed in. Um, cool. Let's look for, oh, sorry, not cancelled, just moved online. Sorry. Yes. Uh, lots of courses have also just been moved online. Um, uh, uh, yes. Uh, okay. What am I going to, oh, so Narwhal's Art Pimps is suggesting that's still the case in most big American PhDs. I'm suggest, I'm guessing that that's maybe the thing about learning a new language. That's very cool. If it is, I would like. Oh, and someone, else, Eric Border as well, saying in my country, um, you must have a different language for both masters and PhD. Um, yeah, this guy's kind of cool. I think, yeah, I don't know where I found the time, but I think I, I like the idea. I probably like the idea of learning, being sort of forced to learn a new language more than I'd have liked actually having to do it. Um, there is, okay, 
Biniam has asked, don't know if it's still on your screens. Yes, it is. Um, any thoughts on the SJW versus brochureless dichotomy on the left? Um, and I don't really know. Uh, I mean, I, I don't exist in super online left wing circles that much. Um, so I don't know how much I can talk to this. Um, uh, I try not to get too dug into uh, th those sort of areas of Twitter or those areas of Reddit, say, because actually I think often uh, there just becomes lots of discussion and infighting between people about very specific things which are not necessarily super uh, relevant. But I think this idea, so particularly the sort of the idea of like Bernie bros or sort of brochure list to the idea is, uh, for those of you that aren't aware, is that these are people who... Uh, proclaim to be uh, left-wing, but that their uh, view of politics, their, either in their approach to politics or the um, things that they think are most important, um, are perhaps uh, misogynistic in some way or another. Um, maybe it's that, you know, it's all about leading up to that big old revolution um, and none of it's about actually going, uh, thinking about stuff like domestic violence, say, or um, uh, gender inequality in multiple different ways. Um, and then the other idea is that you've got this sort of uh, SGW or sort of liberal bubble where it's all about um, issues of identity and um, sort of breaking down uh, various binaries of identity and none of it's about the material stuff. And I think it's, it's very much like a constructive binary where I don't, I, I would be very surprised if many people were on either of, you know, to the hard side of either of those spectrums. Um, uh, I personally um, come from my politics from a relatively materialistic angle, right? So that the um, with with the idea that actually, if you um, sort out a lot of the economic questions, that generally will benefit everyone uh, anyway. But I would uh, hate to think I, I I would I would hate to think that the idea of um, me can like wanting to make things better for uh working class people is um in any way if if that didn't also take along um women and trans people and people of color w with it then um you're just uh in the words of the international it would be merely privilege extended unless enjoyed by one and all uh let's go back to the chat uh, I feel like that was a very, <laughs> very good opportunity for me to make a big rousing speech, uh, which uh, I do not have the ability to do so. Um, we will be wrapping up uh, very shortly. We'll go on or maybe look at a few more questions. Um, I don't want to do more than an hour and a half because my throat will be absolutely shot. Um, and I think uh, some of you that have stuck around for the entire stream, I would like to release you to do other things with your life um let's very much quickly go back to those couple of things that i wanted uh to ask you very kindly to do uh one of which is to go uh go to youtube and if you want to be able to catch up on uh future live streams if you uh, have not managed to watch them uh, it's always interesting just seeing what the generic stuff that youtube will throw at you isn't it uh to type in tom nicholas live and uh hopefully it'll be somewhere thank you to the 40 people that have done that already and um, this is going to be the place where all uh, i'm going to put like archived versions of future live streams um if you don't manage to catch them uh as they're done um so do uh go and uh check that out um and of course uh as ever, you can also uh, check out my Patreon below. Thank you so much to those of you who already support me down uh, on that. Uh, it's amazing. It makes it makes uh, it so much more certain uh, where my money's coming from each month, and therefore means I can set aside more time uh, to do all this stuff and make videos. Cool. Let us uh, take. We'll do a couple more questions, maybe. Let's go till uh, half past. Um. So, so MS saying um, postmodernism is effectively useless because it uh, promotes a perpetual cautioning against any attempt to create a social program. Um, and I think I've talked about this sort of idea of like scepticism potentially being a thing that, although we generally talk about scepticism as a thing that is 
good, right? It's good to be sceptical of any kind of ideology or any kind of uh, full view of the world. That actually, if you're super, super sceptical about everything, that it does get to a point where, um, as uh, I can't think what their name was, uh, MS, I think it was, that put that, um, it becomes impossible for you to conceptualise a different world because you just question whether that world might be dreadful as well. So, or is it actually worth bothering trying um and i've talked about this in i think it was in my video on uh, donald trump and the society the spectacle from a little while ago oh thank you to um whoever that was that just did a a, a super chat or super sticker sorry with keep it up that is a bottle of signal it's very very kind um again yeah those really help to keep uh uh that all goes towards keeping the channel going um but uh and thank you you're always around giving uh comments and stuff which is which is amazing uh, so yeah, um, but uh, so I think the scepticism is important, but yeah, you don't want to over be uh, overly sceptical that you then can't put together any kind of uh, political view of a future world, right? Um, and I think this is something that you have to have to sort of reckon with. Um, I don't, however, think that means that, again, and, and perhaps you weren't here for the earlier early bit when I was talking about it, but... Um, Postmodernism as a sort of theoretical approach, um, it's p potentially not always correct to talk about the theoretical approach. Most of the time we're using it to describe um, a sort of societal condition where we are all sceptical. So to say that postmodernism isn't useful is perhaps a bit of a misnomer, um, I, would, I would suggest. Uh, okay, let's do one or two. Thank you, keep it up. I don't know whether keep it up means just like stay on this particular stream forever and ever. Um, while I uh, appreciate the uh, idea that some people might like that, um, I'm going to uh, not keep this stream going forever because at some point I need to have some dinner, to be honest. I need to have some dinner. Um, uh, cool. What's some last? Th Do I have any thoughts on free will? Ask Shane. Oh, I don't know. I don't know, that seems like, that seems really, that's, that seems so philosophical to sort of go into a slightly different zone than is my, the bit that I tend to think about. I tend to be more about like the, where, where, where I engage with like philosophical ideas, it tends to be um, sort of the like political philosophy um, rather than uh, uh, philosophy in that kind of almost theological sense. Um uh, cool. Ben Rice says, yes, stay on this stream forever, please. We're all so bored. Haha. <laughs> How is it where everyone is? Do let me know. I'm kind of interested in just what life is like um, in uh, different uh, countries at the moment. Uh, we have just, I think last on the last stream, I said I thought it was going to be a £30 fine if you get caught uh outside when you shouldn't be i think it's actually a 60 pound fine i found out the other day um uh someone okay so here's actually a really interesting point something i want to talk about in the future um so fact jargon has written um i can't help but feel that many scholars and youtubers use media to talk about society without really engaging in the text what do you think and actually this is something that i've wanted to make a video about for a little bit um because uh so I think there's two different ways to approach like a film, say. And, and I was thinking about this again yesterday because um, uh, Dan Olson of Folding Ideas put out a video uh, about the sort of about the film Contagion, but obviously also sort of about the present situation in which we find us, ourselves. Um, and it was sort of using that as a way to talk about uh, the world as it exists at the moment and to some extent he, he probably did engage with the uh, the text probably more than you're su suggesting there because I think there are examples of people using films just to think about the world so for example in my, one of my society the spectacle videos I think I look at children of men I don't really talk about children of men at all in that video I just sort of reference a scene about it very quickly to make a point and the point isn't even about children of men it's about the world around children of men and so i think it's definitely important that there is some scholarship and some uh intellectual thinking that engages with 
uh, films as they exist and is really interested in stuff about, you know, how is it shot? How is it lit? How is it sold to the general public? How is it performed? And all those questions. But I do think there's a really interesting uh, sort of genre of academic work, which rather than doing that does actually just go, we're going to use this film or novel uh, or play or whatever else to think about the world that produced it why did the world produce this or what does talking about this particular um film or whatever tell how can we use that as a way of illustrating a point about society um i think the the contagion film uh, the contagion video by uh, folding ideas is does actually engage with the film an awful lot so it's probably not quite what you're suggesting there but i forget who uh, asked this question now as fact jargon um but i think it's really an interesting genre of uh of uh sort of thinking about the world and actually is something so i want so my last stream ended up with me being with me talking about ideas for potential future videos an awful lot throughout like i kept being like um here's something i might make a video about one thing i do want to make a bit of a maybe like a mini series is uh, of looking at the world through films in very much that way. So looking at, for example, uh, I want to look at like Harry Potter and the War on Terror is what I think I'll call the video. And when I look at the sudden shift that happens at the beginning of both the third film and the third book, where everything suddenly becomes, oh sorry, suddenly becomes a lot more dark, um, and particularly in like the aesthetics of the film is really interesting, to look at the idea of, although we often think of, like Harry Potter is like the, uh, sort of liberal film right there's a sort of online joke that the only book that liberals have read is harry potter and um, because they like to liken everyone to hermione or to dumbledore or to harry or whatever or voldemort but it's really interesting actually some of the ways that it engages with the war on terror and the sort of resp or the sort of response to 9-11 in particular and sort of authoritarianism particularly in the uk in the uh, characters in the Ministry of Magic who start to make it all, uh, who start to respond to the threat of terrorism with making more and more draconian laws. Although there's like millions of uh, videos about Harry Potter and I maybe don't want to make more, I don't think the world necessarily needs more. But um, yeah, so that's one idea. Another one is I'd kind of like to look at the 2008 economic crash through the lens of the office. And I'm currently re-watching it all to see, the American office in particular, but I'm currently re-watching it all to see if there's anything, uh, I don't know, just sort of see how it changes over time. Particularly there was a review that I read that suggested that there's a point at which the office becomes really weird because it's just people in fairly stable jobs complaining that their lives are boring and that after 2008 that doesn't really cohere in quite the same way. Um, so I think there's a really interesting genre of academic thought where you look through a film at the society that surrounds it and use that as a way of articulating that and is also something I might engage with in the future. Okay, I think we've hit 6.30. I think we're going to slowly wrap it up there, guys. Um, oh, Jamie von Schwartzberg saying there's a fanfic where the cast of Harry Potter reacts to 9-11. I uh, might have a look at that. Um, and Richard saying liberal slide into fascism via Harry Potter. Yeah, that's sort of what I'm interested in in, in discussing, I think. Um, that, I, that video idea is sort of almost getting there. And it's sort of about, yeah, not actually discussing Harry Potter a huge amount, but going through it almost and sort of going, how can we use Harry Potter to uh, channel the world? Okay, thank you so much to everyone for uh, being here, for participating in the live chat quite so much. Like it's fast, like it's horrible. It's really difficult for me to keep up. I'm not very good at keeping up with the chat, but it's amazing to have everyone here and participating, asking questions, making points. I'm sure there has been so many conversations that have taken place over the last an hour and a half that I've just entirely not been privy to that have just like, uh, just sort of taken place between other people. And that's amazing that that happens. I hope my voice has provided, although it's now going a bit, has provided a lovely soundtrack to those conversations. Um, yeah, I mean, the the thing to remind you is once again, that you can go to Tom Nicholas Live and you can subscribe to that. Uh, and uh, if you want to catch up on future live streams, uh, brilliant, more people have done so. Thank you so much. It also might be that the live streams move over there at some point, if I think it potentially gets annoying for people who just want to watch my slightly more prepared videos uh, uh, that these pop up all the time. 
Um, but yeah, please do go over and uh, check that out and do that or head over uh, to uh, my uh, Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas if you'd like to support what I do here and get like scripts to the, my proper videos um, and usually early access by about five or so days. Um, thank you to those of you that already do support me there. Like it makes a huge difference. I love being able to give away all the videos for free. It's amazing. I love like just the ridiculous amount of people who have been here today is uh it's silly and I'm so grateful to be, to be able to do that but um yeah the little bit that I get through uh Patreon just sort of is increasingly meaning that I'm able to put aside more time uh because I'm able to you know make this more of a it's you know part-time thing part-time job maybe more than full-time job at the moment but yeah it means I can dedicate proper time to it thank you everyone uh thank you everyone saying brilliant things in in, in the chat saying thank you bye etc so thank you so much for being here um uh yeah and i'm gonna sign off so we've got to find the right button to do it but uh thank you so much for watching and uh yeah i'll see you all soon